Hey everybody, I'm Glenn and welcome to the first episode of Between Two Servers, the show where we talk with game developers about multiplayer and netcode. Today we're speaking with John and Drew. These guys have a long history in the industry and worked on Call of Duty Titanfall and Apex Legends. They're bona fide game industry legends. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Cool. So, what are you playing right now? Uh, I'm trying to finish up Returnal on the PS5 myself. A difficult but fun game. I highly recommend it if anyone really likes to get frustrated playing video games. That's cool. (laughs) The uh, bulk of my gaming time right now is playing with my five-year-old son. Uh, And so, uh, we bounce around between like Minecraft and Forza currently. That's awesome. Uh, I always say Robot Unicorn Attack 2. Oh, yeah? Is that a good one? No, but I haven't played anything since Last of Us Remaster. So. You might want to play some video games, Glenn. They're kind I of fun. Get, I, gotta, I really want to get a PS5, but uh, I played The Last of Us, at the original one, and then the remaster at 60, and it's fantastic. And I really have to play Last of Us 2. So I want to get a PS5 just for that. Yeah, so I need to go that's back. That's my desire. I haven't finished it yet, and I should probably go back now that I've got a PS5 and played it 60 FPS. Cause such, such a great studio. Yeah, they, their, their stuff is phenomenal. Yep. Uh, Ratchet and Clank on PS5 is uh, pretty intimidating from uh, as a coder <laughs> looking at it going, oh my god. Are, yeah. they, are they hitting the 60 FPS thing again? Oh yeah. It's they 60. have like three different rendering modes. So you can pick like oh, fully man. ray trace 30 or partially ray trace 60 or like pure performance, no ray tracing. Because yeah, you're never going to get agreement with everybody because because oh, people yeah. want the cinematic look, right? And then, but like I, I personally want 60 FPS or more. Yeah. Right, I know, Drew. You want 144, at least. It's obviously. 240 nowadays, right? <laughs> Glenn, you're gonna want the performance RT mode. Yes, that's what I've been playing in. You get some of the pretties of ray tracing, okay. uh, but they drop the res and some of the effects, so you can maintain 60. It plays awesome. That game's great. Super cool. So, one other thing that I've heard, Drew, you used to be a professional gamer before you made games. Can you I tell mean, us a bit more about that? Uh, professional is a that's a word um i mean this was back in the day this was quake and unreal days but yeah i I competed in clans and tournaments and you know as a 19 20 year old winning a few grand was awesome show us the check show us the the check check. show us the check drew go get it so cool i came prepared just in case if i needed to back up my clans there's no scripting here folks this is all there it is that's this was i believe the summer of 2000 uh, okay. I got first place in an Unreal Tournament tournament. It was really cool. I bought myself a kick-ass computer it? after that. Like, <laughs> it's, it's like an ATM machine. <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I, 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 I asked the guy, I was like, do I like take this check to the bank? He's like, no, 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 you idiot. <laughs> like, you're, you're some dumb kid. I was like, you I know. 19. <laughs> I was yeah. 19. I was, I was in really tempting clan. to take it to a bank. <laughs> the, same, the same time I was in the Quake Clan and I... I we, we, we like, it was in Sydney and we were like the top two. And uh, we went to a cafe in the city and played and we lost. But the winner got this like really weird gravity orb thing. And I was like gutted. And of course, trying to play Quake with that weird novelty, gra- it was like a- The, the Orb 360. Run? Yeah. That thing was wild. It was yeah, awesome, yeah, yeah. but could you actually play Quake with it? I never saw anyone do it convincingly, but the one that always blew my mind was there's this guy uh, he was like a legend at a local LAN party that the they would throw at the Game Spy offices uh, called Bastards Beatdown. Yep. And he played with uh, a Panther XL from Mad Cats. It was like a trackball and a joystick. So wow. he had analog movement instead of you know using the keyboard for movement because that's what the joystick was for. And he would run circles around almost everyone. literally. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So you guys are really good friends. Did you guys meet before you were in the game industry or did you meet in the industry? No, I started uh, my path in the game industry at Infinity Ward right after Call of Duty 2 shipped, which, Slothy, I believe that was your first game. You shipped at IW. Yeah, that was, yes. uh, I uh, had a major fanboy moment when I learned that Slothy worked on the uh, first Savage game like five years prior. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's just, you know, it's been love ever since. I had a dream once and you were both in it. That's how much you're friends. Isn't that crazy? It's like, uh, no, really, it's weird. But like, 
like John and Drew are like, it, it's, it's a thing. So you've actually started your own studio now, which is super cool. Tell me about yeah. that. Go ahead, Slothy. Okay. So after Drew and I left Respawn uh, last year, uh, we both left around February 2020. We were looking at what was out there and kind of decided uh, that it would be really fun to start a new game studio together. Um, and so we started it. Uh, we announced it last year. It's called Gravity Well. Um, and we've spent, gosh, 16 months uh, working on pitch and talking to potential partners mm -hmm. and uh, trying to get it all lined up so we can actually get started soon. Why did you call it Gravity Well? It sounded cool. <laughs> no, cool actually, man. the process, you know this, Glenn, you've you've started a company. The process did you guys just like brainstorm a bunch of stuff? We went through a ton of things. It was like weeks and weeks and weeks of just like banging our heads against the wall. It wasn't the first one we landed on. There's a couple others that we okay. uh, wanted and then found out there was, you know, other people using it in ways that, you know, would have been a conflict. Um, but no, Gravity Well was an interesting idea because it has meaning to us beyond just being a cool sounding thing that everyone has some association to. Uh, also, it's not taken by any other company, uh, game company. So that was really helpful. But we kind of like one of our goals is to make the best place to work and make games uh, the way that we've you know, learned how to make them over the last 15, 20 years. And so we look at it as like, we want to suck in all the best people who yeah. work the way we do, believe the things that we believe and want to make games the way we want to make them and, and have them have this just high concentration of talented folks uh, that have no reason to leave. Like our whole goal is to make a studio that is, you know, for the team, because that's where the games come from. Um, so it has, has a little behind the scenes meeting for us about, you know, the purpose of the whole point of making the studio. And you're a fully remote studio, right? For the time being, we are fully remote. Um, we are in the process of looking for an office uh, cool. somewhere around LA where we're at. Uh, yep. we, were, we, we already have some remote folks lined up that will not be coming to LA ever, you know, yep. or living here at least. I, I could say personally, I, I really, in, uh, it, it's a horrible situation, obviously, but like uh, for me, at least I, I've really enjoyed the remote work. And uh, I found a lot of people that, that we work with remote. Um, it's not the barrier it used to be. Yeah, the, the parts that we really miss are like someone saying, hey, come over to my desk, grab the controller. Like, tell me yeah. what you think about what I've got. Um, and that's the part that you lose when you do remote. Um, and remote is, we, we found remote is really great for when you just want to get stuff done and be left alone. Um, and you miss out on that like hey i had this idea what do you think about it or come try this thing or what do you think about this um and w one thing that's funny is we've found that after an awful lot of time that people have been living at home uh our initial team have been really eager to see each other in person and uh so that's that's the, really the driver for finding an office is it's really clear that uh, of the of the initial people we're hiring, they're really gung ho to come back into an office because they miss human contact. Um, but we don't have any requirements for people coming to work if they even if they live locally. Um, and so I, I I expect this is one of those things that's going to like ebb and flow as people, mm -hmm. you know, miss the parts about working from home they liked and miss the parts about working in an office they liked and find some balance for each of them. Cool, cool. So one of the things on your website, you guys say you're never going to go above 85 people. Well, yeah, that's, it's maybe not a hard line, <laughs> but we definitely don't want to go like, there's a yeah. palatable thing that happens at like a hundred people. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and you've experienced you know, that before. Yeah. We've experienced times. it. Yeah. And it's, you know, communication gets more difficult and you have to have more, you know, in between people, you know, they're shuffling messages and, doing all the, you know, the juggling of stuff rather than mostly the team just being people making stuff. Um, you know, you get lack of involvement from people because they don't feel like they know what's going on or they don't have a seat at the table. It gets harder to keep everyone invested. Um, and so we're just not gonna, we're not gonna do that. Like the the whole point for the studio was the process of making games should be a lot of fun. Like this is, this is entertainment and it's really fun to make games. And a lot of that fun gets sucked out when you are a massive team that you know people just get slotted into their day-to-day -day work and they don't get to have much of an impact on the actual decision making and uh, you know direction of the game 
Makes sense. So let's go back a bit in the history for you guys. So uh, you both got your start at Infinity Ward. And I you shipped one game before oh, Infinity Ward. Yeah. That was, that was East Coast, right? No, that was West Coast. That was way up in wine country. Uh, I moved uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast for my first game job, and that's what brought me out to California. But I was like up in Sonoma Valley. It was beautiful. That's great. Um, and uh, then I, yeah, then I've been working my way south down to LA ever since. Cool, cool. So you both you both met at IW, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. What was it like working at that studio? It was there's a there's a lot of complicated answers to that question. <laughs> uh, I think most of the old IW crew has extraordinarily fond memories of of the our time there. Yeah. Um, I think with the benefit of another decade in the industry, we can look back and see all of the problems that we're hiding, mm -hmm. um, or at least not talked about. Um, but I would say in general, it was an awesome place to work. Everyone was just super invested in the game, uh, super passionate. Everyone's fighting for the best way to use our limited time to make the best game we can with a real focus on end users. And, and that, you guys I learned one so of, one much. One of the defining games of the generation, Modern Warfare, it's insane. Like, yeah, I, I thought it was gonna be my last job. I was like, all right, yeah. this is this is aw this is what making games is like. Oh my gosh, like, I I'm, I oh, can never leave. You hit the jet, <laughs> hit the jackpot. That is, oh, I know. There are so many people in the games industry who work entire careers, never seeing a two percent of the success of that. Yeah, that, that's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, so, I feel very lucky that that was my entrance into <laughs> the games industry. Like it was wild. <laughs> very very cool. So like all the stuff went down. Not going to talk about it, and you guys started up Respawn, right? And then you had this absolutely amazing reveal at E3 when the Titanfall demo came out. You'd been completely silent. I think there was only like, a, there was like a blurry image that in hindsight you could kind of go like, that's a Mac. But like, but no one knew, had a fucking clue what you guys were doing yeah. for years. And then you busted out at E3. And I still remember a picture of that wall with every single fucking E3 award every single one swept yep. how did you guys do it i mean that whole process for titanfall was just so much work just like untold amounts of work uh, i mean there was the whole lawsuit that a large amount of the team was dealing with um mm -hmm. for the first couple of years so I, we actually didn't do as much as you would have expected in those first two years uh the plus majority of, switch yeah plus we did an engine switch after a year yep. which obviously doesn't help um but that, I mean, it, the the way Titanfall came to be and the way we showed it off, it's really a testament to the process that that team taught us and we have really believe in. And that is free up people to make stuff and be creative and run with things that they think might be cool and cut stuff that's not working and iterate. Uh, I mean, there, Jeff Keighley did the final hours of Titanfall uh, for the release. And in there, I gave him some footage from some early prototypes we did before it was the Titanfall everyone knows and loves. Uh, when we had a like an actual single player, uh, mm -hmm. multiplayer was totally different. But we got done with the, both the single player and the multiplayer prototypes, and this was like summer of 2012, so like a year before we showed off the game at that E3. And we looked at the time we had left, the team we had, the prototypes we had built, and we made the decision that we can't make a quality single player and a quality multiplayer game to our standards. And so what are we going to do? And that's where the rubber meets the road of how decision-making happens on on that kind of team. And we leaned into multiplayer because we said, you know, single player, there's not a lot of innovation in our prototype uh, and it's not necessarily where players seem to want to go. So let's take our skills of a combined single player, multiplayer team, having done Call of Duty and now these prototypes and try and meld them into something that's trying to satisfy kind of what both do. And that's where the whole campaign multiplayer thing came from. But really the- such a huge thing at the time. Yeah. No yeah, one, was... no one, like no one did just a multiplayer game at the time at the scale in AAA that you guys did, and no one put single player elements inside the multiplayer, like in that demo. Yeah, I attribute a lot of the uh, uniqueness of Titanfall to the design team and like Steve Fukuda, the game director. They really pushed stuff hard and like slothy early on. You were like, "Hey, we should have dedicated servers." I have no mm -hmm. idea what that looks like or how we're going to host them or who's going to pay for them, but. Yeah. This this client hosted stuff is holding us back and designers mm -hmm. can't do cool things because we keep having to put limits on them because of bandwidth and CPU and memory. And so that was like an early call that 
uh, you know, the studio bought into that open up the designers to be like, well, what if we had AI and what if we had, you know, so all these is, things running around and like bigger maps and, you know, this is another crazy. huge thing guys, because we're, we're talking 2012, 2011, that mm -hmm. wasn't done. People didn't do dedicated servers. You did peer to peer mm -hmm. or, or you did player hosted servers and someone would cook a burrito in a microwave and they're the host and the, the game, <laughs> the game's messed up. John, could you tell us a little bit about how, how you came to the conclusion to get dedicated servers? Yeah, I mean, I had done player hosted uh, at Infinity Ward when we were working on Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare 2. I had done a lot of bandwidth optimizations and kind of gotten every drop out of that stone that I could. Mm -hmm. um, and there had been a consistent theme where designers would ask for more stuff. And there was this like really frustrating conversation where I kept having to say like, no, unless you want me to drop the player count. Yeah. Um, and it's hard because I was the bad guy in that conversation yeah. uh, because I can't anthropomorphize bandwidth. Um, but I was kind of tired of being the bad guy. And it was clear that like the actual problem, like what they're asking for was reasonable. And we just kept saying no to it. Yeah. And when you find yourself saying no to designers over and over and over, it's usually a sign that something technically is broken. Yeah. Um, and so the the idea of starting over and doing that whole process again of uh starting with a new engine and you know trying trying to come up with something new while constantly shutting great ideas down was yeah. sort of depressing as hell that's one um, of the things as a multiplayer guy you're like i can explain to you why we cannot have this but we cannot have this and yeah. it sucks you know, like and, and it really sucks people like yeah you know, and I knew, you, I mean, we, we used dedicated servers in the past. But we'd never done a game that relied on them. Yeah. Um, and I knew that the actual problem there was like, like a business cost issue. Mm -hmm. And so that was where I was talking to the studio heads about like, hey, if we can solve this, I, I don't understand the economics of, you know, mm -hmm. large scale server hosting. But if you can find someone to crack this, like we can do better stuff. Uh, and that's when Jason West basically told me like, all right, go ahead. I give you permission. That's um, awesome. And so I went and started talking to Microsoft at the time and said, uh, you know, we, we really want to figure out how we can do affordable, dedicated servers. Um, and they thought that I was speaking for Jason and not just a coder who worked there. And so they spun up the machine thinking that Jason had made, was making this official ask. Um, and they spun up a whole new d division there to do uh, this thing that uh, they had a few names for it, but Xbox Cloud is what it was called for publicly for a while. Um, and that was something that they really worked with us closely on to do. Uh, and they did a, a, a really nice job of solving the cost side of it for us so that we could just focus on, you know, what do we do given that we're going to have dedicated servers? Uh, and that was huge. I like if you, if we hadn't been able to do that, you would have gotten a game that felt a lot more similar to other games. Like yeah. you wouldn't have had all the AI grunts running around. You wouldn't have had, uh, there certainly would have been a cap on the number of Titans that you could have in the map. Mm -hmm. It would have felt like kind of an arena shooter with, you know, a couple more things going on. So, so um, basically you, you didn't, you had a, you had a problem that was outside of the technical, you identified a technical limitation. And then you went off into the realm of business and strategy and, and found an interesting way around it. And now, because the download speed is so much more from ISPs, you can go, we can fit more stuff in. Yeah, yes. Uh, the, the limitation on player hosted is always on the host's upload mm -hmm. um, because most internet connections have such a relatively low upload speed and they really try to maximize everyone's download. And so if it's a, if it's basically you're running a, a server on someone's home internet, the, the, the weak point in that is always going to be the upload from them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can solve it by making the games use less bandwidth, but you're kind of sure. back in that, that cycle of trying to, trying to limit what your game does or do very, it, the implementation becomes very expensive because you're trying mm -hmm. to figure out the, the lowest bandwidth way to implement everything. And if you can kind of erase that limitation you can implement a lot more things have a world that's a lot richer and bigger uh and and that was the part that i found the most exciting about this it worked 
So, yes. so basically, you, you, you did that, you went to E3, you showed them something completely different in multiplayer they'd never really seen any before. And the press went nuts over it. How did it feel? I was highlight of career. Like you'd think doing COD 4, you know, breakout success or Apex hitting 50 million people in a month. But awesome experiences. But there's something so uh, raw about going to E3 after working on something for years and yeah. laying it bare. Like I was yeah. so close to that. Like that E3, I yeah, killed it was myself. You. It was personal. Yeah. And I was like, I, I don't think anyone's going to like this. Like I was so, so close to it. I was convinced it was mm -hmm. bad. Um, so to have like, to see the smiling faces of people as they were watching our, you know, closed door demo, we demoed to Miyamoto. He came by and got like a private demo and he was like sitting there smiling the whole time. And I was like, this is awesome. And then, yeah, all those nominations and awards going up on the wall. He like was it was just a, such a huge amount of validation that now we, we made a lot of good choices in those mm -hmm. three years of leading up to that point. And it, it was really, it's probably one of the top moments of my career. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to say from my side, when you make something that is different, um, it, it, it's impossible to erase the hindsight that you have now, but like showing up to E3 with something that doesn't feel like any other game is, it is more scary than people realize uh, of like, are we just going to get a bunch of people saying, wait, what, this is has no single player, it's online only, what happens if I don't have internet, you know, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all the stuff that you worry about before you go show it, because this was close to the deal with it thing with Adam. Yeah, Wolf it was, well. but, but even aside here. from all that, like <laughs> ev all the new parts weren't new to my brain anymore. So my brain was really yeah. focused on all the potential things that people might hate. Yeah. And then you show up and people were like, Whoa, there's so many new things. We had wall running, we had mantle, mm -hmm. we had mm -hmm. all that cool, like player movement. We had the Titans. It, it was, I was proud of it, but then I, you know, people reacted really well to what we had made and, uh, that's the part that you can never be really sure of when you're going to go show something. Mm -hmm. I actually felt the same way on Modern Warfare 1. Um, although both times you have a hunch that it's like, this This feels good to me. I, I think it's going to go well, but it's always one of those things where it, it early people can steer the conversation on something. Mm -hmm. And so all it takes is someone who's super negative and then you get a mm -hmm. purely negative conversation on your announce day. That's tough. Yeah, we, we uh, you know, for a long time, the game was 3v3. And, and then it finally became a 6v6 game, I think it was. And, you know, there were headlines of like, Titanfall is only 6v6. Like, you know, they're always looking for clickbait. Like it's only, limited to. Yeah, limited to 6v6 six, six or 12 yeah. players only. And it's like, well, well, Battlefield can do 64 players. Why should we care about this smaller player count game? Because they don't want to reduce everything to a this versus that. And it's like, you're always on any announce for me at least I, I care a lot about marketing and how we talk about our games to players and how we represent the games that we're making you're always thinking about those things like how do we how do we minimize the chance that someone's going to have a terrible clickbait headline and how do we increase the chances that the things that we think are cool about our game are the things that players take away from our announce and so on Titanfall I think we did a really great job I think on Apex another it was the, that's another example of the whole plan to launch uh you know a secret game came about because of the same kinds of thoughts about what is messaging and go like, how are players going to respond mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and just doing the things that we think are best. So it's let's talk about, let's talk about Apex because I, I actually went and worked at Respawn with John and Drew for, for a few years and did a little bit of work on Titanfall 1 and a little bit on Titanfall 2. And uh, I left and then you guys busted out with a, an announcement of this new game and you could play it right at the time of the announcement. How the fuck did you do that? That was a long journey, actually. Uh, there's like the process. You surprised me. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> there's like the process, decision making, design side to it. There's the marketing side. And then there's like the technical side. Because, I mean, you stealth launch a game. You have no idea how many people are going to show up. You don't have pre-order mm -hmm. numbers to gauge server capacity off of. You don't have uh, YouTube views on your marketing trailers to tell you how excited people are. You go, you go in blind and you're just like, all right, and we're going to put on our big boy pants and, and do what we can. Uh, so it's a testament to Slothy and his team. Like it was him and two other guys that created and ran the entire backend infrastructure for Apex. It scaled to, I think the official number was over 2 million concurrent on that. So would that, would that be Callus and uh, Dern? Yes. I thought so. Yes, the two cool. mics, they rule. Shout out. Yes. yes. Mike's, Mike's forever. 
Yeah. Uh, but the the interesting part about it was that project was not Apex when we started it, not in the slightest. It was a totally different game. Uh, I had taken over the project from Steve Fukuda, who was the game director on the two Titanfall games, because uh, he was going to go do a uh, Skunk Works, you know, like mm -hmm. start something small, uh, which I think they've publicly started talking about a little bit because they're hiring for the prototype team there. Um, so I took the project over. We were in the prototype stage. You know, we were doing a bunch of different stuff and a couple designers prototyped a battle royale. Um, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And play test this was that. Yeah, sorry. This was like 2017. Yeah. Uh, this was like PUBG was out and Fortnite right, wasn't right when a PUBG thing yet. was just bursting out and just yeah. becoming this like, no, it's not a game, it's a genre. Yeah. Everyone realized it. Yeah, it was like spring, summer of 2017. So as the head of the project, I was like, well, this is the thing that's getting most people excited during play tests. It's a thing that's doing the most new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we started putting more and more people on it until there's like, okay, this is the game. Like we're not making that other wow. thing we thought we were gonna make. Wow. And the problem was it's it was gonna be Respawn's first release since being acquired by EA. Mm -hmm. And you know, EA doesn't have the greatest reputation on uh, keeping their hands out of studios. So um, there was messaging concerns there about, oh, Respawn is sold out. They're making a bandwagon game that's just Battle Royale because you know it's a fad. Um, and we really believed in free-to-play from day one once we right. made the switch. Um, yeah, just for the record, that was not EA meddling. That was entirely yeah. the team's call on all those things. Yeah, I, yeah. I got to say, I think EA's reputation for meddling is not really deserved in the modern era. I don't, I, I don't think it is. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it's fair to say that they really do just let teams kind of do what they want. I mean, the, there's times where they have to protect, you know, publicly traded company stuff like, oh, mm -hmm. a FIFA has to ship every year. So they're going to. You got to make money. Make that you happen. Ship units, you know, you got you you know, to do it. They didn't come in and tell us what to make or that it had to be free to play or how to monetize it. Uh, they make sure that it will monetize and that it will be well received by players. But. Yeah, going free to play and making it a battle royale game that was all us that was that was on the team um so yeah the the messaging problems if we wanted to do a normal six to nine month lead up on apex would have been you know respawn sold out they're you know they're just mm. going after the money ea is making them make this garbage also where's the titanfall 3 because titanfall yeah, yeah, 2 yeah. was so beloved that to make a titanfall universe game without titans and wall running and you know bt mm -hmm. or jack like that mm -hmm. was obviously going to go over like a lead balloon um, so we worked for me and um, Arturo, he was the head of marketing, shared a wall with him. And so he and I were like, you know, attached at the hip trying to solve these kind of problems as we were working on the game. And the, the solution was, we can't talk about the game until it's out. Like you, you gotta let the game do the talking because so that, otherwise the genesis. you'll have a negative, you know, So, the, uh, so this story. is the actual genesis of your launch strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It was, people need to get it in their hands. They need to try it because yeah. if we just describe it on paper. Yeah. They're going to find some reason to hate it. And yeah. once you play it, you'll see yeah. there's a reason why we made those decisions. It worked. Yeah. It yeah. worked. Yeah. So how many how many players did you have come through in the first few days? Did it blow your minds? Uh, it was a million in the first day. I think we hit 10 million. I'm trying to remember what it was. Day two or three or something like that. Like it was it Might have been the bonkers. first week. I don't know. It was a lot. It was yeah. bonkers. Like uh, I, that whole first month is a blur. Like I can't really replay it in my head because it's just... Not only are you like, what is happening? Yeah. But you're also like, okay, nothing can break. And things it's like work. most most games go up and then they go down. No, you know this I mean? is just a yeah. this is a straight you, you went line up. up. <laughs> it didn't get, it didn't slow down. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was wild. And then you know, EA's comes knocking. And they're like, oh, hey, you guys, you guys did it. <laughs> and like and, you know, and then you've got the eye of Sauron <laughs> on you, realizing the opportunity that's there. Yeah. And you know, the team is now way bigger than it was because. Yeah, I don't think have... anyone could do what you guys did with that today. I think I think you did that move and you came out with that game. I think even if another team did what you did with Apex, they couldn't get the same launch that you got. I think I don't the know. opportunity for that's maybe gone. I don't know. What do you it think? It depends. Like we we spent a lot of time talking about when should we release. Like mm -hmm. we released in February. Uh we had originally planned to release in like the September before that with a smaller set of characters and Maybe there was nothing to buy yet. It was just, there was no MTX. It was like, you know, early access type thing. But, you know, you're, you have to take into account what are competitors doing. Like September is right before an Assassin's Creed and a Call of mm -hmm. Duty and a Gears mm -hmm. of War or whatever is going to come out. And they're going to suck up all the air. They're going to own that. They're going to own that month. Yeah. yeah. So you have to find your right time. 
we had heard rumblings that Ubisoft was working on a free to play battle royale, which eventually became hyperscape in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, you're kind of like flying half blind, half aware of what your landing platform looks like, how crowded it's going to be. Uh, and I think if you're smart about that and you're smart about how you get the message out there initially, like we brought in a bunch of streamers, uh, during development mm -hmm. to give us a lot of feedback. And so then when we did our preview event the weekend before, so that press and streamers could play the game so that they were prepared on launch day. Like we had a game that all the voices online would at least be on the same page about what it was, why it was interesting maybe or not to them. And so there's like this built-in explosion of knowledge about the game. We also put out tons of footage that explained everything. Uh, we agonized over literally like the order of which video to show in, at which wow. point during our live stream. And uh, I think it's possible. I, I just think you got to have the game match your ambition. And, you know, we, we pulled strings. Like we know people, like we had a relationship with Shroud because he'd come to the office a couple of times so that, yeah. you know, he was actually, he talked to some streamers when they were like, ah, do I want to go to this EA event, you know, uh, oh, right, cool. after, right before yeah. the Super Bowl?" And then Shroud would be like, yeah, you want to go. Like you're going to want to play yeah. this game. Um, so it's like, you just got to, all those things have to line up, but it's not easy. And it's not a necessarily a one-to-one -one repeatable you know, event. Cool, cool. So John, tell me about what you did to prepare for launch and how on fire everything was. So um, Titanfall 2, we had built out a lot of uh, like high scale backend services for matchmaking and server allocation and, and parties and all sorts of stuff there. And most of that basically just stayed the same um, till Apex. So we already had a system that we knew could scale up pretty scary high. Um, I set an internal. So one of the one of the problems you have when you work at a, at a a big company and you build your own tech is they know how much their tech scales and we don't use that. <laughs> and so they yeah. kept asking like, how high is your stuff going to scale? And basically, the way we do it is we make sure that things are basically you can you know go wide on them. They can. You kind of shard all your data you can you basically scale, scale linearly to infinity for low values of infinity and <laughs> infinite um, servers yeah and so they were like well where's your stuff gonna break and so yeah, yeah, yeah. uh i wanted to not spend a lot of time having that conversation over and over so i decided that we would just declare that we can scale up to six million concurrent mm -hmm. um and so uh basically it was like 2 million a platform for the three platforms. Um, and that combined, you know, we would go to 6 million. And I had pretty good confidence we could do that with with some very minor optimization work to just as we, you know, low tested it at scale. Cool. And that number was so high that they basically never asked again. Um, <laughs> and so it let us like stay focused on on the stuff we had to get done to launch. And we didn't have to like, do you know test after test of well what if it's higher than we're worried about it was just a number that was higher than they thought was possible so that they didn't need to come back again um and so when after launch we hit you know over two million concurrent uh in the end i ended up looking like i was the one who who believed in the game and everyone else was was surprised that it was so popular but in reality it was not that thoughtful i just was really wanted the engineering's the engineers on my team to just kind of keep their heads down and focus on building stuff and not on setting up, you know, test environments and running through, you know, all day test scenarios. There's, there's um, one thing that I remember working with you is you're very pragmatic about spending time on things that are fun and, and not spending time on stuff that people won't notice, you know, no one notices yes. load testing and, you know, all this. Sort yeah. Of stuff. I mean, in the end, your game has to work. Like that is the other thing is yeah. I believe that the the old days of explaining why people can't play your game right now is like mm -hmm. the worst thing you can spend your time doing because it's it's a bullshit answer. They they work. either bought the game or they downloaded it. It, it. That's the promise we're making of the game should work. Um, obviously, that's not always possible and it is really hard. So it's not that I'm trying to trivialize it, but like I feel like that's the job that we're we're doing that is what we're selling a product and that product should work um and but yeah you're right like i don't want people spending time on stuff that is not something that regular players will see mm -hmm. um and and there's good arguments for some niche stuff but like kind of the smaller your audience for each feature is the smaller time you should spend on it 
just mm -hmm. as a pragmatic way. Here's um, here's a good example. I, re I remember. Um, so going back to your decision for dedicated servers, right? You don't have to do host migration anymore. You take yes. all that time you would have spent on host migration, yeah. and Nat selecting and, Nat yeah. traversal is awful and it's it, it's mm -hmm. never going to work. Um, and then someone quits mid game, and guess what? They got picked as being the host because all this complicated algorithms and tuning, right? Well, you know, you just this is the thing that John brings. We're just not going to do that. <laughs> We're going to yeah, I mean, a fun game instead. It's really smart. Well, but it was also a circumstance because back when we were starting Respawn, I didn't have any of that tech. So it was easy to make a big bet. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, build that relied on not having it. that tech. And if yeah. we had that tech, it probably would have been a harder call because cool. people would say like, we built all this stuff just to make why player hosted run it? well. You yeah. know, why why throw it away? Throw it out, yeah. yeah. Um, but on, yeah, on the on the lead up to the, the launch, I was pretty sure our backend could support it. Mm -hmm. Nobody was actually expecting us to need it because... I mean, we were, we were launching against, you know, PUBG, Fortnite, and a bunch of other games that were popular. And so we expected more of a slow, like, word of mouth spread of, mm -hmm. like, people would try it, they it would grow, but we weren't expecting, like, explosive out of the gate. Um, Straight up. And so it, we were really surprised internally at the pace of it, uh, or at least I was. Um, and so, yeah, our second weekend, I think we had the 2 million concurrent. So we really didn't have time to scale up um because even even that first week we weren't we didn't have spare cycles we're just dealing with some system that falls down and trying to mm -hmm. hide it from users and making sure that we're not you know we're scaling up the way we predicted we would and databases aren't getting too big and you know all the sort of maintenance stuff you do as something grows really quickly um and so it was really barely touched from a code side from launch day till that that second weekend when we did the over two million concurrent. Um, and so it was a good thing that we had kind of overbuilt our, our scalability beforehand. You would, have, you would have just had fires and you would have been able to have not reacted to anything except for scaling fires. Yeah. I would have been out there explaining to people why they can't yeah. play the game, which is the thing I really don't want to do. So, yeah. so I got a, I got a technical question for you, John, and maybe a business question for you, Drew. Apex Legends was the fourth game that you two have worked on that had a multiplayer launch, at least. I mean, I'm just going to say COD Warfare is like, you know, like there's several CODs and it's, you know, like it's, but at least at, at Respawn, it was the third launch you did of a code base. Is it possible to have a success like Apex Legends without having had a few earlier launches before? Is it something that you built up to over three games? That is something I think about a lot. Um one of my exercises when we were get, getting started, we're still getting started, but when we were first getting started on Gravity Well was name a popular multiplayer game that isn't made by the company that makes the engine. Mm -hmm. And it's it's there's not a lot. And so, yeah, there is a real risk there that it seems to be something that is kind of untamable by people who aren't intimately familiar with the code base. Um and it could just be coincidence. It's hard for me to like really say that's causal and not just a coincidence. Um, but it is a weird pattern. Um, and it's, you know, when you, when, nowadays we have more. There's games like Fall Guys and mm -hmm. uh, things like that that are, are a very popular game, not made by an engine company. Um, but it's still, it's still an unusual case. Uh, and I wish that were more common. Um, and I think some of it is just um, netcode is really hard. Yeah. And people yeah. who expect it to kind of be an out, out of the box product. You can't get are... netcode right the first time you launch a game. You just can't. Yeah. It's not possible. Uh, even Call of Duty 2, uh, launch of that had, had a really major flaw um, on uh, console that I launched with and we patched, but it was a nightmare. And so even for me on a Quake 3 code base that was, you know, modified, but you would think two games after Quake 3 that the net code would be pretty good there. There's just a lot of easy pitfalls. Uh, and it's stuff that's really hard to find in development. So you keep getting more and more uh, granular and and doing weirder stuff to test in, in development. Uh, like on Titanfall 1, we actually had a, like a DSL line installed in the office so I could play on that um, to get off of our LAN yeah. because I wanted to see like a actual like 
whatever non-commercial internet connection and actually see the things that happen in the wild. Um, and nowadays there's boxes that'll simulate all that stuff for you, but it's, it's hard. Um, so as far as your, your actual question of, can you do it on the first game? I, I would like to say that we did it on Titanfall one. Um, but even then, God, the list of things that we fixed as far as the, the engineering side after launch and, oh, yeah. and on Titanfall two is significant. So there's sort of varieties of success there as well. Um, I think it's something that is really on my mind and we're trying to make sure that we get right early, uh, because surprise, surprise, we are doing an online game. I've only made online games. Uh, I've got seven now. So uh, this is something that that is we need to solve and it needs to be it's kind of like uh, game launches. They, they need to be more boring. They need to be something that does work out of the box to some degree. And the 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 setup for the industry where you can finance a multiplayer game and then have it just not really work very well at launch mm -hmm. is catastrophic. And if we don't fix it, it's going to drive risk averse people into funding, you know, offline games or yeah, games. I, I love, I love multiplayer games. I live and breathe them. And that's that. I mean, like left for dead is one of my classic favorites. I, I don't think there's been a game like left for dead since. You got right? back for blood coming. I know. Yeah. <laughs> They've been working on that for a while now, but yeah. like that, that, that was almost like a genre that then just like, it's such a risk coming out and going, we're going to do a story-based cooperative experience that has no single player component. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's right up there with the, uh, the Titanfall type risk. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot that I don't think players appreciate. That's super hard to do in a game like that. Yeah. Cause the a big reason a lot of studios choose multiplayer or think that they can make an awesome multiplayer game is because you don't have to work on AI like players are providing that kind of you're, you're you can wave away all that work but in a game like left for dead you have to solve multiplayer problems and ai problems together same kind of type of stuff we had yeah. on titanfall and that's huge especially in a game that's trying to have universe and story and you know characters in it like a left for dead like you're you're taking all the problems of both sides and mashing them together it's it's the only game that i've seen that has managed to have a a real story work in a cooperative multiplayer experience. That's it, really good. It, 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 it's, it's one of my absolute favorites. Um, so what do, you, what do you think about launching? Like you're a new studio, Drew. And let, let me just say like, I think that you guys can launch and succeed, no question, but you've already got all these games under your belt, right? Is mm -hmm. it possible for a new studio with a new engine to come out and get multiplayer right the first time? Or should they build up over a few games and expect to have a multi multi game strategy well, to get where they need to be. I think the it is a it is a false statement to believe in breakout hits like these like oh the you know, overnight successes like yeah. when you look at most of the games that blow up they were not the first iteration. Go back to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Yeah. That was the third Call of Duty that that studio had built after also working on Medal of Honor before that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like, it took the learnings and then flipped them on its head a little bit and added and, some and more it's ingredients. built on the Quake engine, which, which was like, I yeah, mean, it wasn't that, in there. there. It wasn't everything new. It was everything yeah. before, but now in a new light. Same thing, or like, like uh, PUBG itself. Like that was a, mm -hmm. like, what overnight sensation, but no. Player unknown, Brendan, he had been working on mods for years before that. Like he had he had been working with player bases around the problems inherent in the battle royale mm -hmm. play, you know, loop. And PUBG was his like, oh, I've solved them and now I've got this thing to show for it. It didn't come from nowhere. Yeah. Uh, Apex being a hundred million users, like we could not have done Apex without if it wasn't built on the back of Titanfall and Titanfall 2. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's the infrastructure like Slothy's been talking about, or just like gameplay elements, like to build a first person shooter that moves and feels that good. Like if you go back and play Titanfall One, you'll be like, Oh, we thought this was great back then. Like it feels pretty clunky compared to Apex, and because there's an extra five, six years of iteration time on it. Yeah. So I think the for new studios or teams that haven't worked together before, scope is the most important thing to let you ship quality uh, stuff. I think Fall Guys is a great example. Wasn't a huge team that built it. Unity's not even known for having awesome net code. 
And instead of like fighting all of those problems that a small team and an engine not built for multiplayer has, they leaned into those limitations and like, what's a scoped game that we can build and have it be polished and functional and work. And it blew up last summer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good uh, and it was out for a for while them. before it blew up too, wasn't it? No, I think that was Among Us. Among Us was the one oh, that's yeah, been sorry. out for a couple yeah, of yeah. years. I get but again, that's another I... great example of a multiplayer game that is super small in scope and you know it can play it on a phone, but it, you still have to solve a lot of the problems about mm -hmm. getting players together and latency and disconnects and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think to, to expect to have a massive breakout success on your first game, probably not gonna happen. So build accordingly, make a game that's scoped to the team you have and the expectations you're, you you can reliably hit and build on that. Like I'd love to see what Mediatonic does next multiplayer wise because now they've they've lived through the fires of a successful multiplayer game and it's taught them a lot, guaranteed. Like you cannot replace that kind of experience. There, there are things that I know having launched games and, and you know, you two know as well that you can't know unless you see the performance yeah. that some users get. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about playtesting, right? Because that's, that's one thing I, I immediately uh, recognized at, at Respawn that was really important, right? So um, you played every week, sometimes mm -hmm. you played every day. How yeah. important is that to your process to make games? It is one of the like core tenets of development philosophies. Like you should always be able to sync the tree to the latest and run the game, see it as it is. So that means people are checking in, checking in compiled maps, compiled binaries. What, the, what a coder sees at his desk is the same thing a designer sees at their desk. Um, so that's number one, not even play tests, just like, can I see my work or can I see my yeah. coworkers work? Um, and then second of that, you need to always expect that you can get a play test going if it's a multiplayer game. So we always try to have a play test area. We have a bunch of machines set up and we can push builds to it. Um, on Apex, we got to daily play tests pretty reliably, because um, that's that's how you that's how you check your work. Like you imagine if you couldn't compile your code, and you're like, just yeah. check it in. I hope it works. Like a fun game is just as complex, and you need to be able to see what you've done. Uh, so we would do a lot of play tests. We think it's super important, but I think the a crucial key that um, I think a lot of teams wait too late to do is to get outside perspective. So we, we called it Kleenex okay. testing because you use a person once and throw them away like a Kleenex, you never- I always wondered anyway. why you call it Kleenex testing because I was like, that's weird and kind of gross. It is weird what and gross, mean? but it's they're, they're uh, disposable players. Like you don't okay. want to bring them back. There's a separate type of player that you want to bring back. So you, you, want that, you want that fresh first take and it must be, must be the first, I have no idea what I'm doing playing this game. Yeah, so when like a, when okay. someone starts at the team, and when, like the first day, we're like, hey, go sit in that closet and we're going to have a camera on you while you yeah. play the game. I remember like, what? it. Yeah. I don't even know what the game is. And we're like, that's yeah. the point. Like we want yeah. you to go in blind. Um, and that's super helpful. It, it, it helps you shave off all the rough edges, find all the problem cases where players get lost or they don't know what to do or whatever it is. Um, and that makes your game immediately more palatable to a large audience because uh, you're too close to it. I, mean, I don't care who yeah, you are. Cool. You're working on a game. You can't. You can't, you can't see it. You know everything about it. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you have, you have enjoyed. It's just like what you said, Slothy, with like every. You know, we'd already been so close to it, and we didn't see all this stuff. And then everyone saw it new at E3 on Titanfall One, all at once. But as a dev, you get sick of it because you're play testing it all the time. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you only yeah in that week. <laughs> Yeah. So play yeah, I, I, yeah, I think reality based development is the most important thing. So reality is coming, whether whether you delay it or not. And so it's good to know it as early as you can. So you can you can try to make something that people actually appreciate and not just something that's uh like your passion project. Um and and we're trying to make something that like millions of people enjoy. Uh so it's it's kind of doesn't matter that much what my personal opinion is on things that you have to go the direction yeah, of the actual outside opinion. Yeah. What'll make yeah. people happy. What's more fun. Uh, the, the sort of banging your hands on the table to, to argue about stuff doesn't really work once your game's out. So yeah. uh, you, you don't really want to do that early either. So when you're doing team play tests, a different type of play test, which is the team just checking the work out, um, the design team's taking feedback and iterating. And that's another really important thing. Um, John, how do you make sure that 
that's representative of the experience of people again when they play at home when they have latency yeah so that one is a, a tricky one because usually well in the olden days people would play in an office um and <laughs> uh, yeah see now so, that we don't have this problem anymore do we it's it's always a take-home test yeah, but even then, like I, these people who are working from home are going to have, on average, a better internet connection True. than people who don't. And <laughs> the the trick when you actually launch a, a really big game is you learn that there's just regions that have worse internet. And so um, this is another one where it's it's in the end it's a business decision of where do we want to launch our game, and that sort of determines what your game can require. And one of those so, so is like so packet loss and latency, and and packet latency loss? yeah, yeah. Of, of like you can make a game that does work basically fine for all your major markets in the u.s but there, there'll be other places in the world where it just is unplayable and you need to know that before you launch because there it's you know if you're if you're not planning on fixing it then selling a game somewhere where people are going to buy it and be unable to use it is uh probably a bad business call and so you really want to be able to test with, you know, whatever your worst case is. And so you have to manufacture that. So let's so, talk about that worst case. How do you work out that worst case? And it's Australia at two in the time. morning on PC. I'm well, Australian and I agree with you. Yeah. That's some bad internet. <laughs> yeah, that one is a matchmaking one that we used to pull out of like, as an example of people would say, well, matchmaking should do blank. And we would say like, okay, so what about Australia at 2 a.m.? Mm -hmm. And what would happen there? Yeah. Uh, but there's actually other places where just the quality of the internet is worse. Um, and so you kind of want to be able to, to we, we use things like we call it fake lag, where you would just make the game delay sending or receiving packets or both. Um, In the and, test. you know, yeah, artificial packet loss, uh, reordering packets, although that doesn't usually end up being mm -hmm. the, the nightmare that the others are. Um, and we would turn that on for everyone in development and you could turn some people on worse and some people on you know the, the a nicer version of it uh because the 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 trick is people will complain that the game feels bad when you do it and what they're really saying is like we want we've been playing on a land and it feels good on a land but once you launch this game it's going to feel really bad and so the fix isn't to turn it off <laughs> yeah that's it the, the fix is to tell everyone so you force we know it, you, you we know it feels bad. It. You, you actually make them play yeah. with it and they play test mm -hmm. it and they can't play without latency. And tell them to be mad about it. Like we're not, yeah. it is not an exercise in getting them to deal with bad feeling game. It mm -hmm. is, yes, no, that's unacceptable. And we will not turn it off until it feels good. Yeah. Well, well, we just won't turn it off. But yeah. from their perspective, we turn it off when we fix all the issues that made it feel bad. Because there will be people playing on connections like that and you know, it has to work there. So that one can be a struggle because you have legitimate concerns from designers that are like, I'm trying to get feedback on this thing I'm working on. And when the game feels bad, I'm, I'm not getting useful feedback on it. So as, as always, you have to find a, a pragmatic middle, mm -hmm. but the answer can't just be, you know, there's one coder with it turned on, checking oh to God. make sure and the game's going to work. And you're just deluding yourselves because you're, that's how your game will feel Yeah. to yeah. most players. Yep. Yeah. But if you get it right, you know, with, you know, all the, all the things we know about of, you know, good prediction and yeah. correction and all, all sorts of things there that you can do to sort of mask and hide these things, you can make a game that does feel okay with bad settings. Mm -hmm. And then you should continue to play test with bad settings in case that breaks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's actually similar to how we uh, will do various features uh, to test them out, to like stress test them. Like the... The best example was the ping system in Apex. The thing lets you look at something and hit a button and like you put a, a waypoint marker on your your friend's HUD or they can you know ask for dibs on something. And when we were doing it, we said this needs to be so good at team communication that it could replace voice chat for a strategically operating team. Because we're one of the goals was we're gonna make a team game. Both Titan Ball games for that had been very lone wolf in mm -hmm. their design. Like you just go around and wreck shop and that was fun. We want to make a game that you had to rely on your teammates to be successful. So to make sure the ping system got the love it needed and the feedback that was going to make it great, we turned off voice and text chat. So the only way you could communicate with your teammates and play tests yes. so you, was... You create a forcing function. Yeah. And then we even wow. did things like where we randomized people's names. So you didn't even know who you were playing with. So you could mm -hmm. be like, 
uh, I'm going to party up with the guy sitting next to me in the playtest room. Like you, we turned off that kind of turn off parties. Like you yeah. had to play in a randomly selected group. You couldn't talk and you couldn't type. You had to rely on ping. And it's like that stuff that, yeah, ping is awesome because we forced it to be awesome. Like you mm -hmm. can't just say, well, make it really good, but we're not going to rely on it. Like, no, rely on it and then people will make it good. This is a trap that I've seen multiple studios go into and myself and some multiplayer games I've worked on. It's a lot of fun to set up three monitors for the same people on the team next to each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you play it in, in the LAN. And, but you see that coordination that you get there, you don't have in the real experience. Yeah. It's a completely different game. Very different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that really improved ping too, because we got a lot of feedback of like contextual issues of like, mm -hmm. I pinged this loot bin. And like, what I really wanted to tell you is look, that loot bin is open, not, hey, there's a loot bin. And so you get feedback like that of like, it didn't help me. I was trying to communicate and it instead made a confusing uh, statement to my teammate. And so you get a lot of improvements to the system based on it. It's not just like making sure that it works. It's also like focusing people's feedback on making it better. Yeah. Cool. John, let's talk a little bit about matchmaking. Right? Mm. Cause there's all like, I mean, you, you, you wrote the original matchmaker, I think in PHP for Titanfall one. Uh -huh. I just had to say that. Yeah. But, um, and then Callus took it over and Lua Resty and a bunch of other interesting stuff. But, uh, Tell us about your approach for matchmaking and like maybe, maybe, maybe talk in terms of constraints because you've got this like ping constraint, skill constraint, the number of players that are there. How do you, how do you balance all that? I want to, I want to be clear on this one that I am not speaking on behalf of, uh, any of the games that respawn or infinity yeah, 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 made yeah. because, no, just, uh, your, they... your ideal and the way that you, John, you think about it. It really depends on the type of game you're making. So if you're making, you know, a very competitive game, you know, let's say it's Valorant, um, you want to make sure that, well, it, it, there's no wrong answer to this one, but my gut is always, you want to minimize the, the amount of players who quit your game forever, right. um, because you can get your game into a really unhealthy pattern if you have a problem where there's more people quitting than oh, starting vicious, your game. It's a vicious cycle because it, it actually will take it all the way down because fewer players, more frustration, fewer players. Yeah. And it'll go it's all the way down. Self-eating loop. Yep. Yeah. One of, one of the patterns you'll see is if people feel like they don't have a chance of doing well, not winning, but just doing well, um, then, then they'll quit. And so if your goal is to, to sort of attack it from that side first, of like, let's make sure that new players don't get stomped. Then you need to do, you know, something to make sure that their first few matches are not a, just a total bloodbath. Um, and, you know, give them a chance to learn stuff. That, that's the other one that game developers really underestimate how long it takes normal gamers to learn all the mechanics of a game because we, we've been playing these games for years when they launch. Yeah. And so to us, it's all very obvious and, you know, it takes you a match to try each gun one time and then you're, you're good. And in reality, we have to be more understanding and forgiving of regular tired people who are maybe not entirely focused on the game that they're playing and they're not trying to explore every feature and every item in the game. So I really want to give new players like a window of time in the beginning to, uh, try stuff out, learn from it and not feel like their, their experience is like punishment. Um, cause it's, it's okay that they are, need a little while to like try things. And so it's not that people have to win. It's not that, you know, we have to like put them in a match full of bots just to make sure that their first match is a win type logic. It's mostly just like, how long did they stay alive after they spawned? Uh, how many times did they die? How many kills do they get? And you would actually and, watch that. You would actually watch that and be tuning to try to get that. It depends on the game. Right. Um, but yeah, there. like if you kind of think back to like Titanfall style where it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's not a casual game by any stretch, but it's not a eSport. It is, you're, you're running around and shooting stuff and some of them are AI and some are players and hey, stop. we're giving you targets yeah. to hit so that even like a, a new player can, can get a kill, even if it's not on a player. Um, and you just want to make sure that you really get that part right because new player churn is just a, a game ender 
Um, and then past that, you want to make sure that people have the right amount of challenge. They're not winning every match. They're not losing every match. And also the ability to adapt to changes in skill. Um, there is a possibility that some of your user base uh, might have different levels of uh, motor skills on certain nights versus others or <laughs> a degradation of motor skills as they sit on a couch for three hours and and do something else um and so you want your game to to be able to adapt to that and and, and the actually the case that i love to bring up is someone's over at your house you go try this game and hand them your controller yeah and, and now you're now skill-based matching for you is applied to them and yeah. so games obviously can't detect that but ga gamers are not necessarily thinking, hey, my friend is about to get absolutely de demolished <laughs> while I'm trying to convince him that this game is fun. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to do a skill system that isn't taking 50 matches to train. Um, it, it's fine if you want to use that data, but you don't get 50 matches from most players. And so you really want something that can be adaptive that gives people varying level of challenge. Um, I always think like the the ideal system for most players is that you know if it's a team based game, you know you win half, you lose half, and if you're winning more than half and or losing more than half, the game might not feel like a challenge. And we see people who churn out because they win every time. Wow, and I, know, I didn't know that. So I would yeah. I would. It's obvious. Like if I'm getting my ass handed to me every single game, I'm like, okay, I'm out. Right. Yeah, I, I, I but think you win all the time and you get out. Yeah, yeah, because winning all the time is actually a predictor of churn, and it it is it's pretty wild. Like you know, you look at the graph of like how many of their last ten games did they win? It kind of like and how long do they retain after that? Mm -hmm. It keeps going up and up and up until they get to the I like, win every time, and then they <laughs> drop off Done. because like there's wow. nothing here for me anymore. Yeah. I'm wow. I'm God here. Yeah, it turns out challenge is fun. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of opinion out there of people who think they don't win enough or that they lose too much or whatever. Uh, and I'm not trying to attack that. Like it, there are games that do it better and worse. And so there's legitimate opinions from people about certain games and the way they're, they're tweaked. But in general, I think we were aiming for the, the mass market to have a good challenge and a good variety of gameplay and outcomes. And so the, the like a, a good example of this is like the sort of in Titanfall they would have that the the team versus team thing and it could you know the loser had to uh, get on the dropship and escape and the winning team had to stop but that like was super cool because you'd always be trying to peg the people escaping yeah. and you'd sometimes get them but sometimes they would get away and they would feel a sense of satisfaction and it was away. it was a chance at redemption yeah. And we we spent a lot of time tweaking the skill system on Titanfall One to make it more and more and more uh, skill based, and and this is where the 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 sweaty phrase would come, and it was it was exhausting to play uh, because every match would come down to the wire. Well, not literally, but we really did a, an effective an job intense, of making that happen more. It was an intense game, and I think a lot of feedback was like, "Wow, Titanfall is such an intense experience." Titanfall One, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah. And and then so, change, did match. you change that for Titanfall 2? We definitely, so the, the way this works is everyone imagines that you have infinite users. And so you can make this perfect match of everyone's the same skill. Yeah. And that is basically. Never happens. Not even yeah. with games that you guys make. Yeah. even Not even with millions. Yeah. Even with millions of players, like that is not the truth. Yep. So there's always a push and pull of like, do we launch this game right now with this group of players? Do we wait a little bit longer for others? And mm -hmm. then if we're not getting enough players every second to launch matches, like mm -hmm. which ones are waiting? Because there's there's also the problem of you could take a, a really high or low skill player and make them wait a little longer for a match. And yeah. they could be upset about matchmaking times and you fix it by it's such a tight widening your 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 range and now yeah. there's people other people are mad about getting stomped and so yeah. it's like there is no easy fix for these things you're, you're I, I know a lot these, of people these three different axes there's like yeah i don't want to match people too far away mm -hmm. right yep. i don't want to have too much of a skill variance or at least an imbalance between teams but then there's there's not enough people to play right now in this region for this person and i have to relax 
along two of those axes sometimes are one. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a tough optimization problem. It, it's almost yeah. really like, it's like there's a flavor, whatever you choose, and that will almost define your game. Yeah. And it's no yeah. And, and so that's, that's one of those cases where we talk about what do you want to do in Australia at 2am of like, mm-hmm. a lot of times people will say like, well, it should never launch a match if the skill gap is too high. Mm-hmm. And then you have, you know, three lobbies that it won't launch. People just can't play. People yeah. get so, so pissed off if they can't play. So you end up finding, like the, everyone always starts with their sort of hard line in the sand of, well, it should mm-hmm. never do this because this is bad. Yeah. I won't and let then people if play you... if latency is above X. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Total and in the end, like early mistake. Yeah. yeah. You, you have kind of two hard problems to solve. One is low pop of low population of like, eventually you just have to have to like relax all these rules and just let someone play your game even if play. yeah even if it's a we know beforehand it's going to be a rough match the alternative is literally stopping them from playing because we decide from our our throne that this match is too bad to launch which i think is bad design mm-hmm. um and then the other one is uh like what do you do with like really high skill players cuz they get exhausted playing only high skill players Mm-hmm. And like we talked about it earlier, they can really cause churn in your general player base, like outsize. Because, you know, yeah. you'll see someone who wins a match by just like such a big margin. Like that... Drew, for example. Yes. I mean, not anymore. Back in the day, sure. <laughs> big check Drew. <laughs> uh, that, you know, there's a lot of people who it, it might be their first time coming back to the game or even if they're, you know, reasonable skill, they people come in with their own sort of narrative in their head of like what is about to happen and if it plays out in a way that just feels hopeless then you know you're you're gonna have people quit so it's not that i never want high skill players to win or that i am trying to punish them by you know pulling them out of the general population that's where the variety comes in of they should win some matches and they should lose some and it can't be exhausting or mm-hmm. you'll lose them too and so that is it's really hard to do yeah, there's it's some, amazing. There's like amazing. a. I, I didn't even know any of this, John. This really, really good info that you're sharing. Appreciate it. The, yeah, the I, mindset I have for it is like you want, as a developer, you want to have the mindset of my best friend is coming over and I want to like share some music and I know their tastes and I'm going to like listen to this track and then on this track and then you take them on a little journey about this band mm-hmm. that you like or whatever. Bad example. But it's the same type of thing. You want every player to have the perfect roller coaster like oh that was a really challenging match and now you get a little downhill and it's going to be a little bit easier and then like oh you've been getting you know really bad teammates let's throw you some better teammates that's an impossible task when for every player but that's the mindset of like you want but you can kind of do it over fun. a few matches yeah it's impossible when you solve it for a single match but you can kind of correct it over time yeah, we've done like on that. Titanfall one. There was uh, it, there was consistent lobbies. So after a match, everyone would come back to a lobby. People mm-hmm. would leave, and then matchmaking would put more people into it. Right. So the what we pool, found was the like pool isn't there. Yeah, but what we found was like you would get a stacked team that over time was playing a newbie team because of mm-hmm. the fact that the it was just trying to band aid the people who left between each match. So eventually, Slothy, and you might have been involved too, Glenn, about breaking teams apart. Yeah, I recommend like, it. Hey, we've detected yeah. too many blowouts. I like, think everybody team... had the same idea, but like, blow yeah. the team apart at the end of each game and throw yeah. them back into the matchmaking pool. And, you know, that has now impact on players because they're like, I miss those lobbies. I miss talking trash or like yeah. being able to say good game to the guy who just won or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, these are right wins it. and losses here. Like there, there are upsides and downsides to the thing, but ultimately as a developer and from a business perspective, you want players to have fun and they're not going to have fun if they're always winning or they're always losing. That's and kind create, of like the they hard create like a little island of players that then never open up and become free for everybody else to play with except like one or two slots. Yeah, so you're- And there's you're, so little you can do there. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah, cool. I mean, the, the, the one we haven't even talked about is skill systems mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and just how much they, they are it's hard to prove that your skill system works because if you're adaptive and you're changing the number all the time, it's sort of like, you're always in a loop of like, well, I was wrong last match, but this match, I got it. (laughs) And then you just do that over and over and over. And so the, the hardest that we tried to do this on Titanfall one is to go back and look if we had predicted correctly match outcomes. Mm -hmm. And 
not not that well um <laughs> and it was hard to know whether that's just because titanfall was a chaotic game yeah. or because the skill system was broken or some other reason um you know like is it because people were partying up and stomping other parties and and it's there's so many reasons that you can't and it easily could even be saturday night is different to friday night yeah it, and so we ended up spending a lot more time on this of like trying to actually make sure that we're doing the right thing because if your skill system is a noise function that's uh not really helping your game at all but <laughs> it's hard and small teams will struggle with the amount it's of work even it takes. harder for small teams yeah because mm -hmm. that constraint of distance is so hard to maintain with so uh, relatively fewer players available yeah and it's still a hard problem when you have the scale that you guys have yeah cool guys thanks so much for spending an hour with us and, it's good uh, to see you again, Glenn. It's been yeah, a while. it's good to see you guys. I love you guys. Yeah. It's been like at least five, maybe even seven years. You got to come back out to E3 at some point. You got to leave your farm. Are they gonna? Are they gonna actually have a uh, an in, a, like an actual convention again post COVID? I mean, I'm sure at some point there will be another gaming convention in LA. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> cool. Well, guys, fantastic. Uh, thanks for chatting with us. And that's it for between two servers for today. And uh, just remember, if you're having lag problems with your game, check out Network Next at networknext.com. Thanks, everybody. See you later. See ya. Here's the hard truth. The internet doesn't care about your game. After all the blood, sweat, and tears you put into making your game, you launch, and some players get terrible network performance. What can you do about it? Build your own internet? This is why we created Network Next. Network Next is a radically new way of linking networks together. It's a new internet. One where networks compete on a neutral marketplace to carry your game's traffic. Network Next puts you, the game developer, in control of the network. We monitor every player's network performance and you choose when to accelerate them. Not only will you see better network performance for your players, you'll also have the security of knowing that if one network is congested, we switch to another in seconds. Now you control the network.